one of the things that I, I found unique, especially in tech startups, is, is your, your background is, is in design. I think you kind of like start more from the experience and you try to think like what is important for the experience, not necessarily exactly like what the features are. Or... Kind of crazy that you decided to go out there and compete with Jira, Sana, Trello and all of these other project management tools and, it's, and do really well. Like your company is growing fast. So what is your unique positioning in that market? We just try to build the best product for this audience and we want to build the best tool for the software builders and the engineers, the designers, the PMs and people who build software. Often companies end up building these platforms or like channelized tools for everything. A lot of these tools are still focused on the agile methods and while agile is used in companies, it's not used in every company. How do you go from, okay, I have a certain set of users that are clearly loving my product, but ultimately you also need someone to cut a check. Another like strength we have is that like actually when you get the tool in people's hands, it takes off. This episode is brought to you by Pendo, the all-in-one product management platform for any type of application. With Pendo, you don't have to bounce around multiple tools to figure out what's really happening inside your product. Pendo makes it easy to answer critical questions about how users are engaging with your product and then turn those insights into action. Also, you can get your users to do what you actually want them to do. Visit pendo.io slash product school to create your free account today and start building better experiences across every single corner of your product. That's pendo.io slash product school. Hey, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School and your host on the product podcast. Today's guest is the CEO at Linear, Kari Sarinen. Linear is the fastest growing and most beloved project management tool in the world. The company is valued at $400 million and it has raised $52 million from Axel, Sequoia, and some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, such as the founder of Slack. Curry led product design at Airbnb and Coinbase before he started Linear. In our conversation, we'll discuss how his design background is helping him build a product users actually love his strong product-led growth approach to reaching decision makers, how to not always rely on data for product decisions, and his stance against incorporating AI-specific features into his product at this time. Welcome to the show, Kari. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me, Carlos. You've done a lot of cool things, but like one of the, the things that caught my eye is that when you were 16, you convinced the CEO of an agency to, to give you a job. Tell me more about that. Yeah, like uh, when, when I was in I was in high school, I, I started I, I I don't know like I got the HTML book from the library, and I really wanted to like make websites, so I started learning how to make websites. And my, some of my first websites I did was for our Quake One like gaming uh, team, and and then like when I was like looking for summer jobs and in, in in high school. Um, obviously I looked at all the, like, uh, the common ones, like you go mow grass or, or something like that, but I actually didn't get those jobs. Um, but then like, I, I realized that like, I could actually like do something else too. So, so I was able to like get in touch with this local, uh, web agency, um, in Finland where, where I was living. And, um, I, I, I was saying like, uh, yeah, I, I know how to use Photoshop and I know how to build websites. So he was like, like kind of like took the risk on me to, to get me there for, for the summer. And, and they, um, I think they, they like, like what I did. So I actually went back there the next summer and I don't know if I went there once again. Um, so I was, I was there maybe like three summers and, and built like designed websites, but also built them. And, and I got, I also, I got more into the programming there. And so I think it's, for me, it, it was like really important, kind of like if you think about yourself as a 16 year old, it's like you're kind of very unproven and and like having someone giving me that kind of opportunity and, and letting me to kind of really work in the industry, I think was really helpful and, and also gave me like confidence that I can also like keep like do more in this industry. And I saw that you've started multiple companies. And then after that, you work in design, both at Airbnb and, and Coinbase um, before starting Linear. One of the things that I, I found 
unique, especially in tech startups, is, is your, your background is, is in design, right? I've seen a lot of founders that come from an engineering or a business background. So very curious to, to learn more about how your experience as a designer influenced the way you decided to start your latest company, Linear. I mean, I think like in, in, in terms of like my background in design and the type of company we started, I don't know, it's, it is still the, the company Linear we started, which is, it's just like a technical project management tool for software teams. It is a very technical tool. So I think like it, it is, it would be natural for like an engineer to start it or a BM start it. But I think like it, it's like starting it from like a design background you start, I think you kind of like start more from the experience and you try to think like what is, what is important for the experience, not necessarily exactly like what the features are or, or some like other, like some technical considerations. We always had like very, has been always very important for Linear that the, the experience for the individual and the teams and the, the companies, it, it feels great. And since it's a, collaboration workplace tool it um i think the experience really matters because then the people actually use the product and like if people don't like the product if the experience isn't good they will avoid it and they then then like when a product is about collaboration or communication like linear is it's like that information then is like not there and like it, or it's out of date so i think like from a design background, I think like you you think about more as like what you want people to feel and and see and or like um, how how the experience should be. The other thing, something like I really learned that there Airbnb was about the brand and that how like the brand also kind of influences the experience or like how it, or also like how isn't it, it it can be an advantage in a in a crowded market. Um, so I think that's also like where obviously like as a being a designer can be like, uh, like a good skill set. And, and sometimes I think more um, classically like technical founders in, in Silicon Valley, it's like they don't necessarily think about the brand or how does it make people feel. Um, they kind of just build things and, and kind of like want to move fast, but they don't think about that. What, what does it mean to people or how does it feel to people? There are obviously great examples of companies started by people with design backgrounds. I mean, Airbnb is one of those examples or, or Apple comes to mind as well. As, as, as you decided to create that team that helped you build the entire company, like how did you decide to divide and conquer? Meaning where do you focus most of your energy? In terms of Linear, we, we have three founders. And so my background is in design and two of the other founders is in, in technical like engineering. And with, with us founders, like, uh, so I, I've been, like, been focusing on pretty much everything except the technical aspects. Um, so it obviously like the design and, and, and the product stuff, but uh, also I think my other founders are also helping me with the product things too. But I think like it, this also like changes all the time like, when the company changes, like in, initially. Obviously, I was very focused on the design and the product and building product. And then um, I, I'm still are, but then also now we've been focusing on more go-to-market. But I actually think like I don't necessarily need to do that forever. Like hopefully we can get to a stage and like we have the right people in place and they, they can like run it mostly. So I think like my focus i like to think like i would like to focus on like what are the most important things or like something like that are very where i can have like a unique um input or or it's just like uh my skill set can be like very useful so i think it's still in the in the design and and in the brand that i, I probably still will be like heavily focusing on so like with with the with the design itself there was couple, I don't know, some months ago, we did a UI refresh. And with that project, I was actually initially the one designing it because I had some, some free time. And I, I, I think like, I, I didn't like fully do it, uh, but like, I kind of like did the, I like, kind of like the broad strokes and like, I think like, this is kind of like the direction we should go to. And then the team could do that. 
And then with the brand, I'm still looking at all the like the website revisions and things we do with the brand marketing or anything like that. So I think those things, I, I still feel like they're so important that, and I, I have like something to give there that I want to stay close. Yeah. And I, I find that I resonate with that as a founder, because it's not just one size fit all job description for a CEO or a founder or a pretty much any other type of profession. And I think it's totally fair to consider that a living document. Maybe when your team is smaller, you're focusing more on certain areas. As the team gets bigger, it's okay to, to have a, a, an honest assessment and then decide how to make those, those adjustments in the interest of building something bigger. But I think as a founder, it's, it's sometimes not easy right? To, to let certain things go, especially if you like them or have a strong point of view on how they should be done. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think like, I'm also, I feel like throughout my career, I was, I feel like I never got that attached to a specific job or identity per se. Like I, I know that like my jobs are mostly in design, but I also always thought about the job more than design or it, it's not just design. So I think every company I worked at, I also like also thought about the business or like what should be done there or thought about other things than, than just the design. Sometimes I just like that things are done well. And if someone else can do them well, then I'm happy to let them do it. Um, but then I think the, like me and like a lot of other people in the company, we have very like high standards or criteria. So it's just like, finding those people that can do things really well. Is, that's the tough part. Yeah. And let's talk about the, the market because you are playing a very competitive field. It's kind of crazy that you decided to go out there and compete with Jira, Sana, Trello, and all of these other project management tools and, and do really well. Like your company is growing fast. So what is your unique positioning in that market? Yeah. I like sometimes I think it's, it's, it's very simple. We we just try to build the best product for the for this audience and and so it's it's we want to build the best tool for the software builders and the, the engineers the designers the PMs and people who build software and that's that's it that's it and I think a lot of comp there is a lot of companies in this market but I don't think most of them focus this way or like have this kind of level of focus on doing that i i don't i think they're building often companies end up building these platforms or like generalized tools for everything so a lot of this project these tools started maybe like same place we started from but then they expanded more and more to different types of audiences and th different kinds of use cases and we been just more thinking about like how can we make the like they're really like the best or the most excellent experience for the software teams. And then I think obviously we, all of us are like founders and the, like many people on the team, we worked in a lot of companies and we, we used all of these tools and we used all kinds of different kinds of tools. So I think there's a lot of experience that we also drawing from that, that these are going to like the, like how companies work in this field. I think a lot of companies, a lot of these tools are still focused on the agile methods. And like while agile is, is used in companies, it's not used in every company. In the end, we believe that the, this work and the productivity of companies come from, comes from the ICs, the, the, the engineers and designers who actually build things. And so the tool should also help them and like primarily, ideally help them. And, but obviously it should also help the management, but also, I think that's another thing that uh, many of the companies forget that they, they, they're not really loved by the ICs like we are. Um, they may be loved by the buyers or the management, but, but I don't think it really matters if the ICs are not really using the tool. So that's like kind of like the bet we are taking is that we, we want to align ourselves with the, with the engineers and people who build things. And we hope that that will work out in the end and that that will be like successful yeah that is the classic b2b SaaS trap uh, traditionally a lot of these companies that started even in the last century they are fully optimized for the buyer and not always for that user and 
B2B had this negative connotation around, well, since, you know, the buyer is not using the product, design doesn't really matter that much as a consumer facing product. Uh, and now B2B SaaS companies are trying to catch up, right? And be more appealing to that end consumer, but it wasn't a native decision. And, um, we're seeing this next generation of B2B SaaS companies, including linear in that category that are really focused on the user first and building something that is loved by the, the person who's using it and then trying to create that motion to, to also engage with the, with the decision makers. I'm very curious to know how, how are you thinking about that motion? How do you go from, okay, I have a, a, a certain set of users that are clearly loving my product, but ultimately you also need someone to cut a check. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think it's, you, you need kind of both, especially like uh, the larger the company, the more, more that, that there is, that contrast there is. So, so today still like all of our customers have come to us. And so I, I think that there's always, that's like one thing that works in this method or this way of like building the company is that if you can get the people inside the company excited about you and the, and like I think the only way you can really get people excited about the at some product is that the product is actually good or great that they, they can get excited about it. So if they get excited about it, they will start like kind of selling it in, internally and they start asking for like using it. And then I think when that starts to happen and we start start to see that there's activity inside, we can then kind of engage with more of the sales conversations and and start like engaging with the company and the management of the company or the buyers of the company that hey can we seems like there's like demand or interest um we should try to do like a pilot with 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 the team and see if that like how that would go and like generally it goes very well like people are happy like using the tool so that's like another like strength we have is that like actually when you get the tool in people's hands it's like it it, it takes off. Um, the challenge is always that it's not always easy to get it into people's hands. Um, but yeah, I think like sometimes it, it can still, it's not, even if the whole comp, like all the engineering in the company wants it, but the, it's not the right timing based, like the management doesn't want to do it right now, then it probably doesn't happen. So I think it's still the buyers and then the, the manage, management is the is still the key or the the gate, uh, the gatekeeper there. Um, but I, we, we just believe that like, well, if it didn't happen now, I think it will happen in the future. And like, often it happens that way that like next year that they will come to us again. And like the timing is better then. I don't know if you think about selling, it's, it's like nice to sell when people actually want your thing and, and like, they already like really like excited, excited about it. Versus like trying to like cold sell and, and that like they ne never heard about you. They never tried the product. They have no interest. So I think like we, we like this method because it's, it feels kind of like organic or kind of, I don't know, normal in a way that like, if you think about you personally buying anything, like you're not going to buy anything if you don't want it. Like, so, so it's, it's. It's, it's similar that in, in this company workspace. This episode is brought to you by Echo, the next generation A-B testing and feature management platform built for modern growth teams by alums from Airbnb and Stitch Fix. With Epo, you can increase experimentation velocity while unlocking rigorous deep analysis. From setup to troubleshooting to analysis, Epo makes experimentation easy. An accessible UI makes it easy to dig into performance. An out-of-the-box reporting makes it easy for you to avoid annoying prolonged analytics cycles. Check out why companies like Twitch, Miro, and DraftKings rely on Apple. Visit getepo.com slash product school and 10x your experiment velocity. That's getepo.com slash product school. Specifically about success metrics, how do you measure that love to ensure that your users you know, you can quantify how much your users love you and how much value they're getting out of your product. We don't love making surveys all the time. It it's, it's feels kind of annoying and it's, I don't, you don't always capture all the people in the surveys, but so I think like a lot of times we kind of rely on what we hear from customers and users. So I think like if you search linear on Twitter or like you, 
where we obviously we have customer success people and customer support people and we get these messages and I also get personal DMs all the time about like people love the tool and they tell me why. And that's like the the what I use as a measure is like if we keep hearing this and like when when we are engaging with companies, the feedback we get keeps like we keep hearing good feedback from the companies that are piloting or or adopting the tool. I think that's the success metric. Um, so it's and then I think there is some like other metrics we obviously follow. Like we we look at like revenue and and like if like churn that which which is very low that the generally companies stay with us forever. Some other metrics like we we look at like weekly active users and uh, we sometimes also look at like active users per organization and it's because we like to see that the the tool is actually used in the organization and it's, it's not just like sitting there. Um, and then we, um, we also like measure like what is our saturation or penetration in like, like a startup segment, like in certain stages, like for example, like each YC batch or, or like each kind of like seed series A type of batch, uh, or like a segment. It's like the data is not always like super clean, but we, we like to see that like we we are like adopted like in all of those like segments. And that's something like we, we, we like to bet on this like next generation of companies and, and as well as we, we start working on the, like we are constantly working with the larger companies as well. And one of the, the challenges that I've noticed in, in, in SaaS platforms that tend to be used by, by a lot of people is, is getting them to value fast enough, right? Like it's very easy to, to sign up for something if there's a free trial, and then you start from a black page and it's hard to really get started and, 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 and find value. So in your case, as you think about project management, what are some of those uh, aha moments that you are trying to push when a new user signs up? Well, I would say like, it's also a challenge for us and I don't, I don't know if we have like the solution for it, but um, I think we, we talked about it a lot and designed a lot internally. I don't think we have we solved it. I think we, for the, for the people who just sign up on the page, we just hope, hopefully have them like do something in the tool. And uh, we don't necessarily like, care what it is because our tool is also something that doesn't necessarily make sense to use it. If you don't have other people there or like, unless you use it for your personal use. But if you think about like, oh, I want to use this for my company, then I think the first things you should do is like you should invite someone else there and you should kind of like try to do it together, do something together there. Um, but then like in, in with the larger companies, when we do the pilots, we have our team to help people with that. Um, so usually it's like the team is, maybe there's a 10 person team that's already working on a project. They, they can like move that project into linear then they, they can like keep working on it as they like uh, are normally working on it. So that's like generally like the best experience we can give. Like when there's a real use case, like you actually need to do something, you need to actually manage projects or coordinate the work. Then like, that's like the best thing we can do. It's just not like, yeah, possible to do it with everyone who signs up, but like any, any larger company that we engage with, then we, we try to do that. But yeah, I would say like, we, we don't have like any, that kind of like a magic the like silver bullet for that problem. Um, and even in our case, it's because the product is more, it's, it's like, you need to adopt it in your team or company. You can't just like, you can obviously like try it out, but it doesn't give you the realistic use case one until you actually like try it with yeah. your team. So that's the one thing like we always recommend people trying is this to try it with your team. <laughs> and, and how are you planning your own roadmap and 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 going about deciding what to build next yeah so like as a, as a company we don't we try to like generally do things simply and we we don't look at data too much Some like there is like data we look at but we don't want we don't try to be like too like metrics or data focused company um then there's some reasons for that but um, so like generally like how the road mapping goes is we, we usually look at like 
six months ahead. Um, we are also a remote company in, in two different continents. And I think that also, we always like felt like, and we've been remote since the beginning. So we always felt that the being remote means that you need to be a little more thoughtful about the direction or the road mapping can be like changing direction like every day or every week or something. You need to like really like look ahead a little bit, like why are we doing this and like what are we doing? So generally it's often like me and the some of the leadership group that we we just kind of like sit down and and look at like well what is is there like a sometimes there's a theme for the year like for example this year um we since we've been like the past years we've been really focused on the execution of the like issue tracking or project management we wanted to go a little more into the planning side of things um which then meant that we we started like planning the roadmap purely around that um and and we try to think like what are the most important things for the planning side of things and then we we put that into the kind of like the six months kind of roadmap um and then it might be in two like segments of like this is the phase one and this is phase two and then we try to like do the releases in in like spring and in fall uh, which generally like feels like a good timing for us. Like summer is usually a little bit quiet, weird in in the industry, or especially like we have comp customers in US and Europe, and I think in both places there's like people take vacations and other things. So we we try to like uh, time our launches and more like in the kind of like the spring and fall. And uh, how much artificial intelligence is there on your roadmap? Not a, not a lot. Like it's, it's always there a little bit of, we, we are exploring it all the time, but like we, we always took, took an approach with the AI that, uh, we see companies rushing into the AI uh, world and, and trying to add all kinds of features that maybe work or maybe don't work. And we, we try to like take a little more like pragmatic approaches, like, well, can, what, what is actually something we could do really well with the AI that really well works? And there's some some things like we like when you file an issue, it can check for similar issues, and that works pretty well. And also, it's like pretty like like it doesn't cause any problems if that goes wrong. Um, and then like we also have sometimes like you you create issues from like Slack threads. It can kind of like make a title for you and summarize the thread or something. Again, like it feels like kind of like a low risk thing. I, by the way, like we are exploring more and more like AI features. So there's like a lot of we are exploring, but it's just more we haven't, we want that like the feature actually works really well. That is a, it's a unique approach to AI. I've seen a lot of companies jumping on the bandwagon and early. It's in, in some cases just for the sake of it, right? And they will just build a chatbot to say we have AI. So it's refreshing to hear that you are taking more time to really be strategic around what is it that you want to build related to AI, if, if there is anything at all. Yeah. And I think like, I feel like that's something like the industry is a little bit shifting on this too, because we, I think it's every company is now AI first and AI something. And I think now it's like, kind of means nothing like to, to us, like AI is just, it's a technology or capability that you can add into the product or into the existing features so you can create the new features with it but you can like i think just creating ai features because you need ai it doesn't seem like a good idea like it, we we rather would like to see the ai enhancing existing workflows and features rather than like just pure like creating like pure ai features so as you think about the future and expanding your your product expanding your market share you mentioned before that some of the, your competitors fe had fell in the trap of like just creating way too many things and then diluting the, the, the core value of their product. So how do you think you can do that while maintaining a really high focus on, on quality? Yeah, I, I think it's, that's, that's, the, that's the challenge of the company. I think we, I think we, one of the things we, since the beginning have done done differently is, is hiring is, is that we, we try to hire less people and, and then also try to find people that care about the craft and care about the quality and they can see it. And so when you hire a team that everyone kind of cares about it and sees it, 
it's it's much easier it's gonna happens like more naturally that way rather than someone like me or someone else having to monitor it all the time um so i think we will just try to keep continue doing that and not not like kind of like do do things our own way and not try to like do the, the, a little bit different from the the other companies um i think it's there's always going to be that like there's a trade-off and like there is a there's pressure where when you when your customer base grows and you get bigger and bigger companies there's a lot more like we should be doing and sometimes we just have to say no that like we we're not able to do it this right now we're working on something else so i think like that's that's the trade-off and like you have to be like okay with that um but like what i saw in my past jobs and companies i never saw that like adding a lot of more people never it never increased the quality and it never made things faster either um i think it it does increase bandwidth so you can work on more things at once but like if you actually want to be focused at that it doesn't doesn't like speed things up it just slows things down but Gary, it's been a, a pleasure to chat with you you came across as one of the most thoughtful chill founders that i've met uh love your answer sometimes saying i don't know or like look it's not just about looking at data it's not just about building the next cool ai thing and and it's working for you so definitely you are onto something thank you for your time yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me and thanks thanks for the awesome questions. <laughs>